Today's Center Reviews Nation podcast was brought to you by Manscaped. Head to manscaped.com and use the promo code capital C, capital L, Nation, and to receive 20% off plus free delivery on all their products. Welcome to the latest podcast of Senators Nation. This is Pat LaRusso. I'll soon be joined by my co-host, Anthony Sino, where we'll be interviewing very special guest, uh, former Maple Leaf and Toronto Marley, and Sportsnet radio host, Mike Zygamanis. This episode of Senators Nation, I'm your host, Pat LaRusso. I'm joined by my co-host, Anthony Sino, and today we're lucky enough to have Mike Zygamanis. Welcome with us, Mike. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show today. No, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So how have you been keeping during this pandemic? Pretty good. I'm lucky enough to still be working, right? Lots of people have, have been out of work. Businesses are closing. Uh, you know, life life has definitely changed for a lot of people. So the radio show has still been, you know, still going on the air. And yeah, I'm lucky to be doing that still. And one unfortunate part is UFT's coaching has stopped for myself and the team. And they've been, you know, on and off for a little bit here. The regulations have been changing in, in the city and different phases have been coming in and out. So we were practicing for a while there, then we were off and then we were on for a week and now we're off for another month. So that stopped. And then obviously all the appearances and different events I get to do around the city, either with Leafs alumni, the NHL or um, through different organizations that I work with have been put on pause. So life has changed a lot and obviously spending a lot more time at home and not being able to see friends and family, but it's the same for everyone right now. No, excellent. And uh, what about, so you kind of already touched upon it with the UFT shutting down, um, but uh, I always like to ask our listeners now with like another lockdown slash shutdown on us, um, maybe you can share with the listeners and us uh, any video movies you recommend uh, to help pass the time as the, uh, as the winter months uh, come through here. Sorry, I, you, you cut out for a little bit there. That was just what Sorry. I've been doing? Um, yeah, what you've been doing, but also any movies or TV show recommendations. Oh, okay. That Sorry, that cut out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, no worries. So most, most of my time spent watching sports or during the lockdown with the NHL off, the NBA, obviously MLB wasn't playing. I watched a lot of like the 30 for 30s and different programs trying to catch up different areas of sports that maybe I don't have the knowledge that, you know, uh, most hosts have. So just playing a lot of catch up, which was, which was nice to have that time, especially since you couldn't really leave your house for shows. I'm trying to think there's one show they canceled. Um, the Ozarks. Ozark? Uh, yeah, they yeah. Canceled, Ozark. They canceled that show, really? I didn't even know I that. Think they can- I, yeah, I'm pretty sure they did three seasons or four seasons, and then they're not coming back. So that's what I heard anyway. So I was a little disappointed. I thought that show was was pretty good. I watched all of Game of Thrones, so I hadn't watched okay. an episode of that. So I just pretty much binged it from start to finish. And movies, I usually – I've watched a lot of movies Um I, I prefer, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, from the the 60s and 50s. I like all different, you know, times of film and, and different. I, I, I pretty much will watch anything. I'm not a huge horror fan, but pretty much everything else I love. But, yeah, I, I, it was mostly a lot of sports and, and just catching up on things. Excellent. Um, you know what, Mike, before we lead into, you know, the questions about your career and, and now your time at Sportsnet, um, I do want to bring up to you a recent interview we just conducted with Anthony Stewart, um, where we discussed his hugely popular uh, meme game um, that he's got going on <laughs> on his social media. Um, you've appeared on a couple of these memes. 
Um, what are your thoughts on Anthony's social media game, and what has been your favorite meme that he's included you in? Oh man, it's 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 <laughs> funny. I chuckle a lot. I I don't even. Sometimes I respond to his memes with a meme, and I know it's like I'm not even close, but I pretty much don't have anything to say, or I just laugh, or I send one of those like crying face emojis. <laughs> Besides for that, I can't. Yeah, his meme game is strong. I don't know anybody that comes close to it. A favorite? Well, he's starting to change the faces, right? So yeah. it's like, I don't even know where you do that. I didn't know you could do that. So it's like, <laughs> memes with the face changes. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't even know what to say about that now. They're funny. I feel like it's good entertainment for for people on social media. And you know, he's he's really good. He comes on our show usually every Thursday at, at eight thirty, and we always have a good chuckle. We get to talk hockey, some sports, what's going on, and in our daily lives. He just had his his fourth child, and you know, we're all happy for him. He's he's pretty busy now, but. Yeah, it's it's great to have him on our show and his meme game stronger than ever. And you know, hopefully he keeps uh, he keeps that up because he keeps finding new material. I don't know from where, but he must have he, like a I mean, he must have a meme guy. That's what I'm thinking at this point. <laughs> what? Um, I don't. Uh, um, I'm sorry, Anthony. Mike, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, Mike, I know hockey players are trained not to to kind of talk out of school in the locker room, but are you allowed to tell us any surprises you got going coming for Anthony? Uh, <laughs> no no i don't uh i'm not gonna go after him like i said he'll eat on social media he'll come and get you it's uh no i i prank him sometimes on the morning show on on lead off but it's yeah not not I, I, he's definitely not a guy you want to go after because he'll he'll definitely have the last laugh no that, that was pretty funny not gonna lie we had a good little chuckle with uh, anthony as well um, but you know what? We do want to you know take you through your career and kind of let our our, our listeners know you were actually drafted twice. Um, so as I was doing my research, you were originally drafted by the Buffalo Sabers in the 1999 entry level draft, but due to like a clerical error or, or timing or something being faxed and corrected to the NHL, um, you know the league ruled that you had to re-enter the draft. What was that whole experience like, and where did things kind of go wrong? So. It, it, the contract went through at the last second, and the issue was is that we agreed on we agreed on the numbers and the term, and the issue was that we sent in the one we agreed upon. They sent in a different one, so they didn't make the adjustments to what we had agreed upon, and that caused issues at the league office. Then the player association got involved. And it was just a lot of confusion from there. There was a couple other players in similar situations, not with their contract dispute, but the fact that they got it in a minute after, because I guess if three or four contracts are coming at the same time, there could be some kind of delay. So that's what happened there. I ran into the draft. So first time around, yeah, I go to Buffalo. Second time around in 01, I go to Carolina and I, I went to camp without a contract and ended up signing was when I was down in the AHL in Lowell and started my career there. But yeah, definitely, uh, you know, not the way you want to start your career having to get drafted again, <laughs> but made it through there. And, you know, it's, uh, it was definitely, um, you know, not the easiest way to start, but learned a lot about contracts and what goes into them and the whole process and having to figure out, you know, you're just trying to get yourself into the league at that point, right? You're 18 years old and you drafted and then you can leaving the OHL or CHL, you can start playing at the age of 20. So, you know, you you just all players at the end of the day. Yeah. You want to get the best contract, but guys just want to be on the ice, you know, where and play the game they grew up enjoying. And um, if you don't have a contract, that's tough to do. Yep. And uh, that's a, it, it is crazy to me. I always find that interesting when players do uh, get drafted twice. The, a guy recently that I've been following is this uh, he, a name that probably not a lot of people know, but Xavier Simino. He plays in the QMJHL. I only know him because he's at the World Junior Camp right now, and he's going through that same thing. And I was like, okay, maybe it's a little bit more common. But then when uh, me and Pat realized that it was because of a clerical error, I was like, wow, that's got to be like such a unique experience right like because it's like right there yeah and and then it and then it and then it all switches right in front of you 
Um, but anyways, on to your Carolina, uh, into your time in Carolina and Lowell. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, what was your uh, time? Uh, how did you find your time playing in Carolina? Right. It was like it's it, at the time, not that uh, as a well-established of a hockey market, uh, even as it is today. Um, were there any highlights of your career, even any lowlights uh, within the Canes organization that you'd like to get into and share? Yeah, so Jim Rutherford, who's the GM in Pittsburgh, he's he was a general manager in Carolina. He was the one that selected me and gave me my ch- my shot at the pro level, and uh, I kind of owe him everything for my career and giving the giving me the chance to develop in Lowell. And uh, I was there for two full seasons and then two half seasons and a part of a, a third. So I was there for uh, you know five years with the organization until I got traded to. St. Louis and that Doug Wade trade, but yeah, he's definitely a guy that I owe a lot to in my career. Carolina is a, uh, it's, it's, it's not a big hockey market, but they have passionate fans. Great place to play when we were winning. It was incredible, sold out and they love their hockey down there. And yeah, the, the Carolina organization was really good to me. And, and like I said, gave me my first start and, you know, Lowell and, and Raleigh, I, I enjoyed both cities and, you know, made a lot of good friendships, uh, guys I still talk to today. And, you know, uh, without those chances to play in the NHL at the end of those, uh, that in 02, 03, and 03, 04, um, I have a hard time believing I would have been able, you know, to play for the the years that I did get to play at the AHL and NHL level. What Did you, uh, so obviously you were there for that, uh, for that cup, like you weren't there, you got traded before, but you were on that team originally that eventually goes on to uh, win the Stanley Cup. Did anything about that roster kind of stick out to you early on in that season where you're like, wow, they got something special in that locker room? Yeah, absolutely. It was a, it was a great group of guys. The chemistry was great. The culture was amazing. Peter Laviolette was a great head coach. He, I'm not sure if you guys remember, but the year after the lockout, um, there was a full year off and mm-hmm. all the major rule changes were done in, in 05, 06, right? Yeah. So he kind of saw what the rule changes were going to be and got ahead of it with not taking penalties, making sure you weren't taking the stick penalties because that was a big issue, right? A lot of teams were taking, you know, five, six, seven penalties, these, these uh, I guess, quote-unquote lazy penalties. So he, he really got ahead of that in training camp and made sure we were aware of what those old tendencies were and really got us to squash them in our games. But that was something from the coaching staff and something, it's not something you just put on the board. You had to practice, you had to talk about it all the time and the way he prepared us, that was one major thing. And then some of the systems he got us to adopt um, with, uh, with other rule changes, it was definitely almost a, a pioneer with, uh, you know, where he saw the game going. And I think it was a big reason uh, why the Hurricanes won a cup. Yep. And then, yeah, for sure. Like Peter Laviolette um, still to this day is a well-revered coach. So that, that definitely aligns with, I'm sure what everyone knows about him today. Um, interesting now to know that he, uh, that he was kind of getting ahead of the curve there because I do remember watching that season. It was just, a parade to the box literally every every game it was it was crazy but like it's almost like how they uh it, it's almost like it was needed right to kind of just like ever kind of just everyone hit hit their head on the wall keep hitting their head on the wall until it eventually stops I guess so you, you never know how that game could have been with all these stick penalties still being called like if they were if they were still kind of eased way in but um for sure frustrating as a fan watching that <laughs> That that year, because I, I can't imagine playing with those uh with those rules in place. Um, but and now on to your next few stops. Uh, you go to St. Louis, you got Phoenix, and you got Pittsburgh. Um, what what did you take away from kind of each of those stops? Um, again, like the like th- another three teams that ha- definitely had some fantastic players, uh, for sure. Um, but and, and you also got coached by Wayne Gretzky in Phoenix. So, like, there must be some some great stories across all three of them. But there, is there any that stand out for you? Uh, any any unique characters that you met along the way that, that you think are uh, 
some some good uh, some good lessons to take from that took you uh, throughout your career. Yeah, well, my first full season was in Phoenix playing for Wayne and definitely gave him a shot to be a, a regular and I kind of got off to a good start there uh, with the Coyotes and uh, halfway through the season we were just above 500 we were kind of hanging on to that last playoff spot and then things kind of unraveled uh, at the end of January February some injuries and stuff and other teams kind of ran into a bit of a, a rough patch but it was my first time you know I guess having a spot on the roster years previous so there was a bad pass or a bad shift or a bad game it was, it was usually right to the minors healthy scratch and then to the minors so um i kind of had a somewhat of, of uh, you don't have total security when you're a fourth liner making you know the minimum or on a two-way contract but definitely some sense of security where i i kind of knew i was going to be there the rest of the year um um you know signed a, a two-year extension uh, just a little over halfway through the season so uh, that was a that was definitely something you know I'll remember for my pro career and, and happy that you know Wayne gave and, and the coaching staff uh, really took their time with helping with my game and what I needed to become a regular NHLer so I definitely owe a lot to Wayne and, and the Coyotes organization uh the year in Pittsburgh uh was obviously special winning the Stanley Cup and that group of players going to the finals the year before, I, th I think that they, it was a real learning experience for them. So um, I got, I got traded to them when they got back from their two games overseas, they played two, their first two games in Sweden. So I joined them for the home opener and uh, you know, I got traded from Phoenix, but I was in the minors in San Antonio and it was, it was almost like I was looking for, I was looking for a place, but I was going to finish out the last year of my contract there. Then all of a sudden I get a, a call after I left the rink saying you got, trade to Pittsburgh you got to be you know on a plane in a couple hours pack all your stuff up because you got to practice and you're in the lineup for the home opener so wow. I kind of go from yeah you kind of go from uh, you know is my career over this is my last year might not get another contract uh to not even 24 hours later um you know I'm I'm looking I'm in the room getting dressed with Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin and you know Flurry and Nat Gonchar um Shatan, I mean, the it just filled the superstars, and yeah, literally your your luck, as they say, can change that fast. Excellent. Um, so let's just fast forward a little bit, Mike, um, to when you, you know you you made you signed your first contract with the Leafs. Um, as someone that was born in North York, what was that moment like to sign uh, with your hometown Maple Leafs? Yeah, it was it was a huge thrill. I played. With Dallas Eakins and the Marlies the year before and played about a dozen games and they wanted me to stay there. I wanted an NHL contract. I'm not sure if they even had space at that time, but it was kind of tough because I joined them um, into end of November, October into November and they already had their minor league players there. So it was almost like I was taking a young kid's spot. You know, I was later in my career, so it was kind of tough for me coming in there. I, I wanted to show them that I could still play and get an NHL job. They offered me a contract in the minors, and it just I, I, at, the, at that time, I, it was tough taking a spot away from a young kid that thought he had made the team right from the East Coast. So that yes. definitely played a part of my my decision because I went and signed over in Stockholm with with your garden in this and got to play with some of my friends that I had played with a couple years prior in the NHL. So. Um, that's kind of what happened when I got to the Leafs or the, you know, the Leafs organization in, in 2009. So the season finished and we kind of reconnected with management and they asked if I wanted to come back on, on a two, a contract and said, I'd be given a chance at training camp to make the team. And, you know, at first it was a big thrill just even to sign that contract and, and second to, to be there for the starting lineup and having my parents in the crowd. Um, uh, I, you know, I, they, I've seen the video of them panning the blue line and, um, I look like I had seen a ghost and <laughs> I, I think the feeling was, was something very similar. It's, it's really tough to explain, you know, growing up as a kid watching Wendell Clark, Gary Lehman and, and Doug Gilmore and, and actually finally getting a chance to, you know, it wasn't in the Maple Leaf Gardens, but just putting on the Maple Leafs jersey was was something special and 
you know, definitely cherish the couple months that I got to play with the Leafs. Yeah, that that does. Uh, I almost got goosebumps there just when you were telling it when you're like seeing ghosts. Like, wow, that's actually pretty. That's a powerful statement, honestly, to for a kid for Toronto um, to describe it like that. Like, obviously, you everyone loves the hometown hero, hometown kid story. So uh, I'm sure everyone's gonna like listening to that for sure. Um, uh, so now let's talk about that. Uh, first kind of full season with the Marlies. I believe it's 2010, 2011, right? Uh, and then also in 2011, 2012, where you had your kind of career year um, with uh, 61 points in 68 games. Um, kind of, I, w- I want to know, what do you, do you attribute a certain, uh, certain someone, a coach, a teammate? Uh, do you have to want someone that you want to shout out for that success from that 2011, 2012 year? Uh, where you had all, where you were putting up those points, um, playing some big minutes for, for the Marlies that year. Yeah, it, Dallas Eakins was uh, the head coach then, and and definitely a, a big part of it, bringing me in, and uh, you know he was definitely in my corner, and um, I, I'm I'm not for sure positive, but fairly positive that he was the reason that that I signed there and, you know, he was, he, he really, you know, advocated for me to be on that team and, and in the organization at that time. So, um, you know, he played me a lot of minutes, gave me a, a leadership role, uh, maybe an assistant captain and, you know, I definitely kept my, my career going. Cause you know, I still want a chance to play in the NHL and, you know, obviously every player in the AHL definitely, you know, no matter what year they're playing and they, they definitely want to, they definitely want to, play in the NHL after while they're while they're in the AHL so he he knew that was was something that was still a goal of mine um but yeah him and and Derek King was 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 amazing on the offensive end and you know I had some you know rough rough times during my years with the Marlies um you know on and off the ice with my uh, just that time my career and then um issues I went through with um, personal stuff with my family so you know he was he, he always made it fun to come to the rink and at the time they you know I, I I didn't really voice a lot of the stuff and I still haven't really talked about a lot of that stuff maybe someday um, you know there will be a time when when I do talk about um, you know maybe a book someday <laughs> talk about some of those stories but yeah they you know and Gordon Dineen was was also there and part of the coaching staff and they all made me feel welcome and um, you know, really gave me a place there on the team. So definitely forever grateful. That's, that is good to hear that the, it's always nice to have someone in your corner, um, especially when they're, when they're coaches, right. That can affect it, uh, can affect your opportunity so greatly. Um, but now also to bring it kind of more to a, like a, a current state, uh, I, can you confirm to us that uh, that 2012 2013 year, like the kind of the half lockout year, did you were you uh, like I know Morgan Riley joined the the Marlies late in the season. Where uh, did you get a chance to to play some games with him as kind of a like a I think was he 19 or 20 at the time? Yeah, I, I was there. He right at the end of the season, a couple games. I, it might have been half dozen, uh, maybe seven or eight. So yeah, I got to play with him and. You could tell right away when we got to the first practice, and we were you know, practicing special teams that he was going to be a you know a, a career NHLer and you know all star. And you know he's he's I don't even think he's tapped his potential. He had a great year, uh, a year removed from this, and you know ran into a little bit of injury trouble. But I think what we saw from him two years ago is something that we'll see more of, and I, I think he can even bring more to the table than, than what we saw in his all-star performance two years ago. Cause you know, he was in the Norris conversation most of the year and and just a good leader on and off the ice works hard. He has the skill, obviously he's a great skater and you know, he's, he's tough to play against and you could definitely see that even from day one with the Marlies. Did you see that? uh, Did you, even when he was a young kid, I know it's tough when the when when rookies come in and they don't want to kind of step on anyone's toes. They don't want to be too vocal. But did you see any leadership qualities that you might have noticed back then? And kind of, you know, you clearly see it now when he talks. Like he's so revered in the locker room. You could, he's like kind of like the voice. I would say he's kind of the voice of the team. He's kind of the middle the middleman of the older guys and the 
and the younger core of the team. Like, did, did you notice that in the uh, in him as a young player? Yeah, you you could tell right away that he definitely had those qualities, and um, I. I thought he would be the captain for the Leafs. So, um, you know, Tavares is a, you know, is a, is a is a great captain for the for this Leafs team. But uh, I really did think that, you know, Morgan Riley would would hold that spot. Um, you know, you never know what happens later, M- moves, injuries, um, whether well, he stays with the Leafs or not. But you know, he he has those, he has the the captain traits and. Like I said, he's he might not be the most vocal guy, um, but definitely knows what to stay in that room. And you know, I, I know a lot of people in that organization do see him as as one of those leaders. And um, you can just tell when you're watching the game, right? He he has that command. You see when they when they you know pan to the bench, he, he's you know always you know communicating to his teammates, he, and you can tell he wants to win, right? He brings that work ethic, that leadership, and he brings it on a consistent basis. So um, I'm looking forward to see kind of what his ceiling is because I, I, I think he's just scratched the surface. Um, uh, his potential to be, you know, one of the best in the league uh, on a regular basis is, is definitely there for him to take. Um, Morgan Rye has definitely been a player that I've enjoyed watching. I remember when Burke said that, you know, if he was picking number one, that Morgan Riley would have went number one that draft. And looking back at that, what, top 10 in, in Morgan Riley's draft, I think he'd probably fall even one or two when you look back no, at all the players that didn't one, turn out, right? One, not even a question one. It's actually, that 2012 draft was pathetic, the top 10. I yeah. Know, so it's, it, I, it was clear. Burke definitely knew what he was doing there. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, like I said, great pickup, was a great prospect, and not surprised what he's, you know, like I said, a little bit of a, an off year this year, but the year ago, uh, not surprised one bit when he was in the Norris conversation. So, Mike, you have a, a an interesting perspective because you've played in Toronto. Now you're in the Toronto media. Um, I do want to ask you your thoughts. Um, back when Tyson Berry moved on from the Leafs and signed with Edmonton, um, he made mention about how difficult it was to play in Toronto when things are tough. Um, kind of want to get your thoughts. How tough is the Toronto market? In comparison, because you also, you know, during your playing career, you know, you made, you know, a few stops as well. So when you look back, is Toronto really that difficult of a market to play in? Or is it just something that maybe some players just don't have, you know, the ability to kind of handle, you know, the market itself? It's definitely a a bigger stage than other cities. The media, I think it's criticized, I guess, maybe unfairly at times. I think it's great that you do have that many reporters and and media people that are interested in the team because there's the interest in the yes. city, right? There, you know, Brian Burke said something really interesting in our you know the meeting to start the season before training camp. Usually, the general manager addresses the whole organization. He says, "Guys, we we need the media there. We have to talk to them." Um, we have to let them in the room and we have to be welcoming. And uh, he said, we, there's only 20,000 fans that can, can come into the arena to watch us play. There's millions of fans in the city and throughout the country. Um, you know, the media wants to tell our story. We need to be there for them to tell the story of the team. So, you know, he was very understanding of, of you know, the role the media plays. But, yeah, I, I think it, at times it can get on you as a player. Um, and the fact that if you're always picking up the newspaper and you're watching TV, I, I think that's tough. And regard, and Toronto's not the only spot for that. I, I think you can put any Canadian city in there, um, but definitely Toronto. And from what my friend said in Montreal, definitely at the top. And, you know, um, it is that big stage. And I feel like some players can handle it and some can't. And it's it's not a knock on players. It can just be overwhelming at times. Um, for me and my time here, I mean, if, if I, I was from Toronto, so the, I, I was okay at, at not reading the paper every day and not watching, you know, the TV and, and what, what reporters and, and, and the media was saying. But the, the other part of it that people don't realize is that if you talk to friends or family, 
they're going to talk to you about what's being said, which is even worse. <laughs> so now you're hearing, you know, from, uh, you know, one person removed from what's being said. You, and that's the way they interpret what's being said. So now you're like, they really say that or they think that or I'm doing that. Nice. So that can be really tough at times um, because, you know, I, I've talked about this on the radio show, guys. We're, we're talking about the media and what's being said and what's the accountability. And I had a reporter that reported on something. I, he said, I said, which I didn't. And we actually called them out. We called the newspaper and he didn't have a recording of it, which every single reporter records everything Mm -hmm. a player says. And when they said, well, play us the recording back of it. And he's like, his, he didn't have a recorder. His recorder wasn't working at the time. So you know, it's it's sad that there are reporters that um, have to fabricate articles like that, but the majority of them, um, you know, are stand-up people and, and do things the right way and are ethical. So, um, uh, you know, you don't want to let just, you know, one reporter, broadcaster ruin it for everyone. Most definitely. Um, so getting back to the Toronto Maple Leaf organization, um, we've seen them go in a different direction philosophically uh, when it comes to building and drafting the team as of late. Um, how does that differ from your experience playing in the Leafs organization? And what do you think brought about this change? And, you know, now there's been a focus on drafting and developing um, where that may not have been the case while you were in the organization. Yeah, I mean, every every GM has their own philosophy on, on what way to do things, right? Some guys want to have a tougher team. Some guys want more skill. What do your draft picks bring you? What do you think you need in your division is is a big question. I think GMs and management have to uh, answer. At the end of the day, if you don't draft well, you're not going to be successful. You can't just go out there and trade draft picks for players that just and try to get the best players in the league. It, it doesn't work like that. You have to find the right players that play well with each other, guys that have chemistry. You got to build the right culture in your organization. And that's not necessarily just, you know, signing the right player, making the right trade. You have to know who you're bringing into the room. You need to, like I said, you need to draft well. You have to have the right coaching staff, the right player development. Um, You need to make the right moves at the right time. There's going to be trades that are going to have to be made that, you know, if you make the wrong one, it could set you back a year or two. So it's, it's, uh, there's a lot more to it. I, I know everybody in Toronto wants to play GM and I get to sit on the radio for three hours a day and play GM, but uh, let me tell you guys, it's it's not easy. And, you know, Kyle Dubas, I think he's done, a, and, and Brennan Shannon have done a great job here with this Leafs team. And I feel like they've they've put the right pieces together. It's just finding the right supplement supplementary players and um, the just complementing what they have on this team. There's a lot of skill, a lot of speed, a lot of things that um, make – team successful in today's game they've obviously got a little bit tougher that's something they had to address and and they have addressed it um you know moving forward now it's just a matter of going out there doing it so what kind of culture have you built in the last few years uh, do guys enjoy each other on the team and um do guys want to win right it's like i said it's a big stage toronto's not the easiest place to play um when it's good it's it's probably the best place in the league to play um but Everybody talks about the Leafs everywhere, every single day. That's one thing I love about it here. You know, I, I was golfing in the middle of the summer during a pandemic. And what do you think the golf, what do you think the talk was on the golf course? It was about the Leafs in what would have been the off season in the middle of a pandemic. And it was nonstop for four hours. So that just tells you a little bit about how passionate this fan base is. And, you know, would you want it any other way? <laughs> No, not really, not really. Because when because when they do win, it's gonna be like it's written in the history books. Like that that chapter, once they do win, is gonna be insane. Like you can't even fathom what what will happen. So that that just speaks to the kind of the the passion of of the fan base. But in terms of like how I wanna I wanna know basically like you say that Dubis has made you love what Dubis has done, but in terms of their the the core of the roster do you not feel that the like all these the 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 thorntons the simmons the the spetses that they brought in bogosian all those guys i think are gonna bring that accountability factor kind of like that you talked about earlier but 
do you, do you think it's going to ultimately take those the the Marner, the Nylander, the Matthews that kind of light switch to go off for it, them to like really make that next step into becoming like a a contender type type of team? Uh, guys, they have one year to make it happen. <laughs> you think so? Right? I think this is the last year. Yeah. yeah. Um, if if it's uh, you know first round exit again. Uh, I, I don't see those those four coming back together um, for the following season. And this is kind of tough, right? Uh, I'm giving guys a pass this year. Um, uh, I'm not taking any way, anything away from Tampa Bay winning the Stanley Cup, but I, I feel like this was a bit of an off year. It's, you know, your your season gets put on pause in, in March, and all of a sudden you have to take time off, and you're coming back into a bubble situation. Then you're playing at home, but you don't have your fans there. Other teams are dressing in your room. It's just... It's a strange time for the team. I'm I'm giving them a pass for this, um, you know, the restart and and then finishing the bubble. But in all, in saying that, I I, I think this is the last year. And whether it's it, it might be tough with the if it's a 48 game schedule, you know, it might be another pass situation. If it is a 48 game schedule and it's you know stop and go, and if you have COVID cases, and games are getting canceled, you know, I, I think a lot of GMs. A lot of GMs should take that into consider- consideration, although they aren't. Uh, if you've seen some of the moves mm-hmm. and and adjustments the GMs have made, and you know they've traded players for playing bad in the bubble. So, yeah. um, but in saying that, I would give this group one more year, and uh, if it doesn't work out, then I have a hard time believing that that um, Brendan and and Kyle will bring this the, the same nucleus back. So, with that being said. Um, if they do go, if they do go to this forty-eight game schedule, likely a Canadian division. Um, what are your your thoughts on on their chances of uh, where they finish in a seven-team Canadian division and uh, and kind of where they slot with the uh, with the Vancouver's, the Edmontons, the uh, the Calgary, Montreal type teams? I think outside of Ottawa, I love what Ottawa has done. I think they're in the best shape for for long term success on the draft capital they have on what they did in the draft this year. Some of the veterans they signed in free agency, guys they brought back, uh, Matt Murray, Ned. I think that's huge. You you know you can't develop a team if and you don't really know what you have if your goaltender is letting in goals that shouldn't be going in. So I, I like what they've done. Um. Um. I love what they've done with their their organization moving forward. Aside from that, I mean, um, I mean, one through six guys. Like, who do you think is the best Canadian team in Canada right now today? <laughs> you, you, I, you really can't tell that. That, that's why we were trying to help you. Yeah, you I mean, us, I, but, I, but no, yeah, right. no, it's no disrespect. Into, yeah, no disrespect yeah. to the Leafs. I just, I, I think, I think they're in tough with the Canadian division. Um, I know Cal. I know Vancouver. You know, lost a lot of their guys, but I like some of the additions they've made. Uh, Montreal probably got the did the the most and were the most active. Um, I think they're going to surprise a lot. Edmonton, you have the best two players in the league: Drysaitel and McDavid. Um, Calgary, I like what they did. Winnipeg, they got the best goaltender in the league, and Paul Maurice, who I played for. So, yeah, that's why I say one through six. Like, I, I really don't know right now. Uh, I think you'll tell a lot the first, you know, 10, 15 games of the season. But it's it's really tough to slot, uh, you know, one through six right now. And that actually kind of leads into my next question because there was a report earlier this week um, where it appears – each division, no matter how they're organized, uh, would play the first two rounds of the playoffs against one another. Um, how does the idea of an of a Canadian division, on top of that, factor in with the new possible playoff format? Does that improve or worsen the Leafs' chances of making a playoff run? Should they have to play fellow Canadian teams at least in the first two rounds? Yeah, I, I I'm I'm not quite sure. Right, they. It's it's I, I, we haven't seen it right. Um, yeah. I think if they have to play the playoffs against um, you know their own you know a, a Canadian team, I think it's great for the country. I think it's yeah. great for broadcasting and media. Oh, yeah. But 
playing the whole season against six other teams and then going in the playoffs, like there's definitely going to be some rivalries built in here. And I know, you know, Toronto and Ottawa had it in the, you know, the start of the 2000s and, you know, Toronto and Montreal, that rivalry is as old as anyone, right? Um, maybe hasn't brewed as much in the past because both teams have to be good for it to be a rivalry. You can't have mm. just two bad teams or one good team, one mediocre team. So Montreal's gotten better. Um, that's that rivalry. I think will will ignite again. And then you know, there's going to be a lot of back to back games, right? They said they're going to be playing um, going to the baseball uh, format, right? Where they're going to go in and play one, two, maybe three games. So that's definitely going to build that, you know, some tension with between the teams and you're going to get those rivalries. And then all of a sudden you're going to go into the playoffs against somebody you just played, uh, you know, a lot during the regular season. It's, you know, a, a lot of it's also going to depend on if it's 48 games or 60 games or 70 yeah. games. So um, if that's what the NHL needs to do to, to play during these, these times, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all for it, but uh, an all Canadian division team, it, an all Canadian division is going to be more exciting than people think. So I'm, I, I want things to get back to normal, but I'm kind of looking forward to this Canadian division guys. Yeah. <laughs> so sure. Mike, can you imagine what possible eight games of McDavid versus Matthews? Like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just excited just on that matchup alone, let alone, you know, watching Edmonton play Calgary possibly eight times. You know, like, it's just, oh, it's just going to be so much fun. And McDavid and Matthews are now training together in Arizona. So we'll see. Like, that's going to be interesting to see. If they can pick up some things from each other, I'd be uh, I'd be pretty scared if I was just a, if I was a defenseman in the Canadian, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. the Canadian teams. For I sure. saw a video of Matthews stick handling through, stick handling through some tires. It was on, <laughs> I think it, it might have been on Instagram or TikTok, actually. I don't even know. And he just and he just rips it past them. That I forget who did that article, Mike. It was out. It was on Sportsnet, but some someone wrote about how they 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 grabbed Peter Budai in that uh, for if for this like kind of the this makeshift training camp that, that Matthews uh, and McDavid's agency has. What do you think about like a retire a retired goalie like Peter Budai going a net against the best NHL players in the world right now? How crazy do you think you got to be to get in the net with those guys? Oh yeah, it's it, you know they don't they don't let up when they're training, right? These guys, you know, they're they go 110 percent and the best in the world. You know, they don't when they're when they put the skates on, they go out there. You you better be ready to go. I can remember, you know, the junior goaltenders or a goaltender from college, and they'd have to fill a net and all NHLers oh. out there. They don't, they don't go easy on them. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely got to be fun. Um, I've known uh, Peter for, for years. So, you know, really good guy. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's a good test for those guys in the off season. Nice. So now let's, uh, I mentioned sports net, so let's shift, uh, shift there now. Um, what was the process like going from being a professional hockey player and, and, and now, comparing that to your time at Sportsnet? Because you've had some time to get your feet wet there uh, and kind of get your uh, get your legs under you. And maybe uh, talk about kind of the adjustments you've had to make to now be on the media side of things. Yeah, so it's it started, I, I was doing a Leafs morning skate, which was the hour called on, the, on Jeff Blair show from 9 to 12. So I would go on for an hour, do, you know, you do two segments in the hour and we would just kind of talk about the last Leafs game and, and tee up the next one. And it was, I, I was, you know, it's different when you, when you start doing that, no training have, have never been, um, you know, in front of a mic, you don't know what you sound like. You don't know if it's interesting. You don't know if what you're talking about makes any sense. So yeah, <laughs> you, ha- you have all these insecurities, right. And, I enjoyed going on with Jeff Blair. I, I wouldn't be here today uh, on Sportsnet without him. He, he made me really feel welcome there. He kind of, you know, knew what my strengths were, knew what I like to talk about, kind of knew my background. So, and he really highlighted those. And I think that definitely made that transition into broadcasting and media a little bit easier. And then from there, I started doing the pre and post with Gord Stelic. And you know, he's been around for, you know, one of uh, one of the greats in, in media and, 
you know, well known in Toronto. So was was really lucky to go on and and fill in there when Mark Savard was was off, you know, on vacation or would be able to do a game. And um, you know, that was a whole another experience because we were there till eleven at night, midnight if the game was, you know, central time zone or on the west coast that was there till one, one thirty, right? Um, and it's, it's one thing to sit on your couch and watch a game or, you know, be in your car, leaving a buddy's place, you know, after watching a game and, you know, you're, you're out for dinner and then you're going home and you flip on the radio or you're in front of your TV and your couch at 11 o'clock. But when you have to be on and engaging, it's a, it's a whole different game. Um, so that was the first thing that I, I kind of wasn't used to because, you know, you, you got to be up and you got to be ready to go. And because usually, you're, you know, your work's not starting till those, those games are 6 30, 7, 7 30, and not out of there till 11 o'clock or midnight. It was, um, you know, it was, it was definitely something I had to learn to, you know, making sure I was awake at that later hour because, um, you know, it's not like sitting at home and, you know, you're watching the double header and, you know, with your buddies, you know, ordering a pizza or something. And it's, it's fun to sit there and watch and it's entertaining. But then when you actually have to do it, it's, it's tough. Um, from after the pre and post, um, I did some hockey central uh, at noon. Uh, and that was interesting because that was the first time it was simulcast on TV and radio. And I was played at the NHL network throughout the U.S. And um, I know a lot of GMs watch that. A lot of players watch yeah. it. It's it's in the room, so it's a great show uh, for sure. Yeah, I was I was a little nervous there because that was in the CBC building, and um, uh, you know that was uh, that was a whole a whole different you know whole different situation, right? It's it's radio, but it's TV, and it was kind of confusing at the start. It's you know getting used to it, and um, yeah, definitely something that took me a couple of episodes to you know uh, really feel comfortable, but. You know, it's I, I go through the same things that everybody else goes when they start going into the media or, you know, whether it's a, a journalism student that's, you know, in college or broadcasting. And, you know, I, I have all the anxiety I, I, I have. I, I, I panic sometimes. I, <laughs> I think about an episode and, you know, a show or what's going to happen. Am I prepared enough? What happens if I stall or I forget what I have to say. So, you know, I have all those same insecurities that, you know, students have in college or somebody that's starting out in media that, you know, they're, they're behind the mic or, you know, behind the camera for the first time. So um, I went through all that with Hockey Central. And then I started doing uh, three hours with uh, Scott MacArthur. I was filling in and, and it was a nine to 12. And I went for, they wanted me for a couple days and went in and asked me if I could finish the week. I said, all right. And, you know, you know I kind of joke with Scotty. I'm like, man, you must have, you must have, you know, got somebody really mad at you for having to go on for three hours a day for a week with me. And he's like, man, no, this is great. I'm enjoying it. The show's entertaining. Great feedback. He's like, how do you like it? I'm like, yo, it's a lot of fun. I, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great, but hockey wasn't back. then, so kind of mm -hmm. had to talk a little bit, little bit about everything. And then, you know, asked me to come back for the second week. And I was like, second week? I'm like, three hours, all sports. I'm like, all right. You know, Scott's, uh, you know, kind of hitting it off. Uh, you know, it's been a good show a week. And I kind of went back the second week, got a little bit better. Um, you know, you kind of build that chemistry up with your who you're hosting with. And uh, came back, they asked me to come back for the third week in a row. So I'm like, third week, I really have, you know, learning, you know, on the go, as they say, right? And the show kept developing great. And, um, you know, we, we, we had the chemistry, I, I think right off the bat and then it's kind of developed. And I, I feel like, you know, every month there's, we're, we're finding somewhere new to go with, with the show. And it's kind of, you know, evolving to something, you know, bigger than I think a lot of people expected. And, you know, I, you know, you, you hear things and you hear what people in the media say and, I didn't realize that there was actually media talking about the media. So <laughs> I was like, I got into the media to talk about the players that the media was talking about. Now I got other media talking about me on the media. So that was kind of confusing for me. I didn't realize there was, you know, people that, that they rate you and you're, 
when you're in media and they critique you when you're on the air. So <laughs> I got a little bit of a chuckle of that when I started and I, you know, you notice and you just hear about different media personalities that critique media personalities and, um, you know, people that are broadcasting and, um, you know, I, I, Hey, it's great. They, you know, they want to talk about you. They're interested in your show. If they, you know, they want to tweet and, you know, sometimes it's not always nice. And I do see those tweets and, you know, I see them trying to be negative and trying to get under your skin, but I, I think it's, you know, I have a good chuckle and a laugh with my family and friends. And, you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm flattered that they're interested in myself and, you know, in the show and that they feel the need to, to rate it and critique it and evaluate week to week. And if you mess up a word or you talk about something you shouldn't have talked about and, you know, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, the, the morning show has been great. We've, me and Scotty ha, have been on it now. Uh, I guess this is, you know, we're going into our, um, you know, fourteen months now. And uh, like I said, it's 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 been great. It's early. <laughs> yeah. So that was we started at nine to twelve, and then we got moved to six to nine. The whole station did a shuffle and uh, made a bunch of changes, and you know, certain people. You know, when when went on at different stations and and different job opportunities, and uh, they decided to fill us in in the morning, and and it is early. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna sit here and say, oh yeah, <laughs> wake it up at four a.m. Guys, let me tell you, this is the life. <laughs> what's, but what's no, the, it's what's it's, the comparison for a late night show to a morning yeah, show? Well, it's dark either way. Yeah, I don't know. I I if I had to pick. I would go nights, but both tough, right? It's, you know, yeah. up at 4, 4.30 usually, trying to catch up on anything I missed from the night before. Um, you're really cramming, right? Because you might, you know, pass out on the couch, you know, halfway through a game, or, you know, you might not catch all the games at night, so you have to make sure you're seeing everything in the morning and then, you know, having to take on everything and then, putting it all together, then making the show interesting. It's got to be entertaining, right? Um, I think going on and and just talking sports for three hours is, uh, you know, can sometimes get a little bit of stale. So we, you know, we try to keep to general topics, right? Let's not talk about, you know, the way a player shoots the puck or the pitch count or, yeah. um, you know, whether the quarterback's coming out of the pocket. Like that stuff's great. And I'm sure the fans in each of those sports really want to talk about that. But, the general sports fan in Toronto and the people who listen to the podcast uh, or they're online or they catch our show later in the day, you know, they, they want to hear about general topics and they want to, you know, what did they miss from the game the night before? They want to learn maybe one or two quick things that, you know, something to talk about with their friends. And, you know, we try to bring that to them at the same time. We venture into stuff that happens in everybody's, you know, daily life. And cause I think they want to know that they want to know a little bit about Scott, a little bit about myself, um, um, you know, all the great people that work on our show. So we try to include everybody and, um, you know, it's, it's just a good environment and, you know, we have a lot of fun and, you know, we try to be engaging. We have, you know, the text line, you know, at five ninety five ninety, people text in and we bring that up throughout the show and people tweet at me a lot. They send me DMS. I get a lot of messages on Instagram. So we try to bring those on and it's, it's really interactive and it's uh, it's a fun show. And, you know, there's uh, uh, from the producers to the technical producers to assistant producers to media production uh, to the senior producers. It's, uh, you know, it's it's a big production. It's a big show to put on and it's a lot of work, but very rewarding. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I'm, I've got a lot of, uh, you know, amazing messages hearing from fans and I, I love to hear from them and their thoughts. Whether they like the show, didn't like a show, something they want us to do. And um, you know, we're, we're always learning, right? Scott's been in, in the media side for broadcasting for a while. I'm, I'm still, I'm still learning. Um, even though it's been over a year, you know, I'm trying to, trying to learn something new every day. And, um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to what's ahead for the, sh for, uh, the show going forward. Um, Mike, speaking of your show and I'm, I'm a long time listener. Um, I, I love listening to you and Scott while I do my commute in to work every morning. Um, a regular topic on your show has been your many trips and your travels around the world. Um, as someone who's traveled himself and lived in Mexico for a couple of years, um, what has been your favorite location you visited? And if you could share with our listeners a story that's not too adult 
rated. <laughs> what has been your favorite story from your travel? Because I have heard on the radio a couple of your stories, and uh, you know they're they're pretty crazy. Not gonna lie. Yeah. This podcast is against censored, Pat. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so my favorite country is Japan. I, okay. I love Tokyo. Um, the people and the culture are amazing. I love the food. It, it's, uh, there's definitely nowhere like that in the world. Um, yes. nothing even close to what Japan is like. A second favorite for me would be Nepal. Um, I love hiking. I love the mountains. Um, I love going to altitude. Uh, the people in, in Nepal are are amazing they're very welcoming it's it's like you know you go into um you know you 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 go into these little small villages in the mountains and you know there's maybe a hundred people living in these little villages and people take you into their houses you know they're five bucks a night you and that includes all your food and it's like they've known you your whole life right so not very expensive and um, my guides were incredible when I've, you know, when I've been in Nepal, but I, I love, there's a lot of history there with, with obviously with Mount Everest and it's just a gorgeous scenery. And, um, if I had to spend one month a year anywhere, it, it would definitely be Nepal. Um, good stories. Well, yeah, I told one on, <laughs> on the radio about <laughs> going into Vietnam without a visa and how I <laughs> kind of, <laughs> Had <laughs> somebody get me on a plane and then like somebody pulled me over, like, you know, <laughs> going, <laughs> you know, somebody pulled, I didn't have a visa going in. Somebody got me on the plane and then I like going into Vietnam and I, I, uh, they pulled me off the plane and like, I went in this room in the back of uh, what I, you know, w- was going through border security and I was in there for two hours and all of a sudden some guy comes back, hands my passport, stamps my visa and I was like, wow, like I couldn't believe it. And I didn't realize how dangerous it was till I got there. Definitely, uh, <laughs> I don't suggest anyone try that. Um, you know, that's that was definitely um, uh, one of the situations up there. I'm trying to go over some of my stories. Um, you know, I, I, I've been lucky. I got to do a, a lot of great things. You know, I, I, I feel like nothing really nothing big really sticks out. I, I've got to do a lot of great hiking and, yes. um, you know, climbing, you know, different summits, you get into a scuba dive, um, got to, you know, learn surfing, got to pick up skiing. I, I love going to Colorado. I have a lot of friends there and family friends. So definitely get there every, you know, every chance I, I get. And, um, and I'm, I'm at around 130 countries now. Wow. So, yeah. And, you know, I have four or five more big trips I want to take and I want to do three or four big climbing trips. If, you know, if my health permits, uh, I did have career ending, um, you know, head and neck injury. So that's definitely limited what I've been able to do, but, um, definitely traveling around and seeing different parts of the world. It's, it's kind of addicting. I don't, and I don't have a fancy car. I don't live in a fancy, you know, house and or apartment and, um, I don't have the watches and the sea news and the boats and the cottages that, uh, you know, some of my friends have, um, you know, I like to spend time with my family and friends. And if I'm not doing that, I, I, I love to travel. So, um, it's, it's nice to be able to do that a couple times a year, obviously a little bit tougher now, uh, with the radio show, but, you know, I can still kind of get away once or twice a year for, you know, a, a couple weeks and, and uh, obviously tough with the pandemic, can't really travel anywhere, but um, it's definitely, you know, a passion of mine. Excellent. You know what? You've been really generous with your time. We're definitely grateful. Um, I do have one final question for you, though. Um, outside of your work with Sports Center, are you working on any personal projects um, that you're able to share with our, with our audience where they might be able to help support? Yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've been, you know, l- lucky to be... Um, a part of the 360 kids uh, youth homelessness in York region. And everyone kind of says, you know, homelessness, youth homelessness in York region, like homelessness doesn't exist outside of downtown, but it it actually is. And it's, it's a, it's a big issue. So, um, you know, 360 kids does a great job from, um, you know, bringing the youth in off the streets, whether they need somewhere to just hang out during the day, whether they need a meal, whether they need a bed for a night, um, they also have a transition center where you can, 
They kind of help you stay for an extended period of time and, and help you get back to some kind of, um, you know, will get you into a home where, um, you know, they'll give you kind of a, a place to restart and, and, and reestablish kind of that family setting. Cause some kids just, it's just not safe for them to go to the where they were brought up in, right. Whether yes. it's, it's not a safe situation or whether sometimes even they're kicked out, it's, uh, you know, people will kind of look at you in, in shock and it, it is shocking. Some of uh, the things and situations that the youth are put in, and 360 Kids does give them a place to go and uh, a place of refuge and somewhere to kind of, you know, um, get them back on their feet and, you know, find homes for them. And, um, you know, it's whether it, they also help with, you know, whether someone has a health issue and um, or they want to help them with schooling. They have many programs and the care they provide in the York region area is is amazing. And the people there that work with them. Um, I'm very lucky to, you know, help with events or, you know, whether, whether even just a social media post or help raising money. Um, you know, it's a great organization. They do a, a, a 360 kids experience where I, I, I spent the night out one year from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And I slept on a on a park bench. And, um, you know, it was one of the coldest nights of the year, first week of, of February. And um, I was sick for a number of days after. And I wasn't able to do it this past year, um, um, past two years. Now that I've I've been with uh, the Fan Five Ninety, just being sick for a week would be, um, you know, w- would be tough. So, um, you know, I was I was kind of I'd like to love to give back in and help out with that that event again. But that's definitely something. If you want to go online, um, you know, three hundred and sixty experience. It's you know, um, sign up. It's they give you a you know a jacket. They send you out with things to survive the night, and it's four or five dollars, and that's all you have to live off of. And they kind of follow you around with the team to ensure your safety. But if you want to see what that's like, and I'm not sure what's going to happen with the pandemic right now moving forward, but that was definitely an event that I loved helping out with. And um, another organization is uh, Baycrest Foundation, and uh, I'm sure everyone's heard of Baycrest in Toronto. There. Um, you know, a hospital and a center and, uh, you know, a, re- a research center where they, they help with people with dementia and Alzheimer's and, um, you know, they treat, they, they have groundbreaking research and um, what they do there. And if you ever have a chance, go for a tour one day. Um, they're finding new ways on how to help, you know, elderly or people aging with uh, dementia or, or Alzheimer's to cope at this time, there's no cure, but it's something they're working towards. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's a big organization. Like I said, they do a lot of amazing things there and they have a Scotiabank program every year. And that's kind of uh, the event that I'm, I'm on the committee with. And we try to meet every month, every, um, you know, four or five weeks and discuss, go over things to do. And it's, it's one of the biggest, charity events in Toronto. Um, I'm sure everyone's heard of that Scotiabank uh, Pro-Am and it's a, it's a night where there's a draft and they bring all the, you know, former players and different celebrities and it's a fun night. And then two days you play games against each other and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun and you get to see a lot of former players and, you know, even guys I used to play with and play, play with, play against. And, you know, a, a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the city and a lot of the community really step up and, and kind of give a lot for that event. And, you know, it's, it's great to see the community come together. But, yeah, Scotiabank Pro-Am, look up that one and the, the 360 experience. So um, those are the two that I, I, I spend the most time with. And, you know, if you have a chance and, you know, sit at home one day, they're, you know, always looking for help in, in any way possible. Well, thanks again, Mike, for your time. You've been an awesome guest. Um, but for the, our listeners that may not follow you on social media, can you let, let, let them know where they might be able to find you? Uh, I believe you said you're on Instagram. I know you're on Twitter. Um, but do you mind sharing where they can find you? Yeah, it's just at Mike Zygamanis on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm on Facebook. I'm not sure if it's Mike or Michael. You'll see my profile. Um, you'll see my profile there. If, I think there's a fan page and I have a regular page where – we could become friends and I, I, I try to post as much as possible. I, I probably don't post as much as I should, but 
Uh, you know, maybe in the new year, that'll be my new passion <laughs> project and get on social media a little bit more and, and interacting with, with, uh, you know, people that listen to the show or are interested in sports. So, um, yeah, it's, it's nice to be able to connect with fans and social media definitely gives you that platform. And I guess now you have Anthony to kind of show you the ropes as well, right? So yeah, I got to get on those <laughs> gifts. Yeah, if you guys have any good gifts, you can get Anthony in any you know any way. Just send them my way, and All right. uh, I'll be sure to unload them. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Mike, for your time, and uh, it's it was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks thank a lot, you, guys. Yeah, appreciate thanks. it.